and um, she studied with a bachelor degree in physics and chemistry and followed with master and PhD uh, in Czech chemistry, uh, working with uh, Catherine Chabel. Chabel. And uh, at that time, she focused already on samarium, neodymium, and lutetium hafnium uh, systematics of modern uh, river sediments. Uh, she, fo she stayed for another year as a lab engineer in the uh, University of Grenoble and followed with a postdoc at Carnegie Institution of Washington with uh, Rick Carlson and then second postdoc at ETH. And I guess at that time she started to switch to uh, working on early earth on uh, lutetium hafnium and samarium neodymium uh, systematics. Uh, she then uh, uh, got a CNRS position at uh, uh, Clermont Ferrand and secured uh, European Science Foundation uh, major grant uh, for her group. And uh, she now uh, sort of developing a new approach to dating of uh, Bendita formations using lutetium hafnium isotopical system. So with this, it's a pleasure to pass to Marianne. Thank you, Andre. So I'm not going to talk about banded iron formation. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'm going to talk about uh, continental crust. So thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, present my work here. And so um, what I would like to do is um, trying to tell you what the neodymium isotopic composition of uh, sedimentary rocks tell us about the composition and the growth of uh, continents through time. So uh, as a brief introduction, um, so that uh, we all start on the same basis, I would like um, to uh, give a small introduction about the, the different types of crust that we have uh, on Earth today. And by today, I mean the past um, 200, 300 million years. So you all know that uh, we have uh, continental crust and uh, oceanic crust uh, at the surface of our planet. And they are very different um, in uh, many ways. So first, um, we can say that continental crust covers about 40% of the Earth's surface. So it is shown here in uh, colors uh, on this map. And oceanic crust is uh, shown by the different shades of blue here. And uh, what is important is that continental crust is mostly uh, emerged, so above sea level. And I would like here to insist on uh, these differences that I will try to make all through the talk, the differences between continents and continental crust. So for me, continents is the emerged part of uh, continental crust. So on this map, it fits pretty well, um, continents and continental crust, but it may not be the case in the Archean. Um, another big difference is about their ages. So oceanic crust is relatively young compared to the age of the Earth, uh, no older than the 200, 300 million years, while you can find pretty much all ages up to 4 billion years on continents. Uh, the thicknesses also are very different. Uh, continental crust is three to five times thicker than uh, oceanic crust today. And uh, finally, the mean composition, uh, especially in terms of uh, silica content, uh, are very different. So the continental crust has an average uh, silica content integrated with depth uh, of about uh, 60 to 61 uh, weight percent, while the oceanic crust is, uh, has an average silica content of about 50 percent. So it means that uh, on average, continental crust is uh, felsic while uh, oceanic crust is uh, mainly mafic and made of uh, gabbro and basalts. So if we go a little bit more in details about the structure of um, the continental crust, um, the, the modern continental crust uh, is vertically stratified. So this is what is illustrated here in this figure uh, from Oxworth and Camp. And um, we think that it, uh, it is probably more mafic uh, at depth and becomes more and more felsic um, when you go to the upper levels. So these um, changes in composition with depth 
is uh, very likely related to the way the crust uh, is formed today. Um, here in this model, it is assumed that uh, the lower crust is uh, mainly made of uh, mafic melt that are directly extracted uh, from um, the melting of the mantle. So man mantle produced juvenile that melts that are uh, relatively mafic. And then through um, intracrystal differentiation, this melt gets more and more felsic to reach um, the silica content that we have in the upper crust, which is about 67 weight percent. So uh, with uh, the sedimentary uh, record that I'm going to be using um, in this talk, uh, we are going to be only sensitive to the upper level of the crust because uh, to make uh, sediments, you need to erode uh, rocks that are above sea level. And so we're going to be only seeing uh, this uh, very um, uh, silica rich part of the crust and we are not sensitive to what's going on uh, deeper in the, in the continent of grass. So this is the reason why also I like the word continents uh, because this is exactly what we are uh, probing with uh, sedimentary rocks. So we also know that uh, modern continental crust is produced and destructed uh, mostly in subduction zones. Here is a figure showing uh, you the different um, amount of crust generated and lost in different uh, geological setting, convergent, collision, and extensional here. So the numbers here in blue are uh, the amount of crust uh, produced in square kilometers per year, and the amount in and the numbers in uh, orange are um, the amount of crust that is recycled. And you can see that the highest numbers are here in the subduction setting. So you form uh, most of the crust in the arc, and you recycle um, back into the mantle. So uh, you are actually losing most of the crust here in the subduction zone via the recycling of sediments. Um, the mass balance is uh, very difficult to do, but it seems that uh, uh, the amount of crust that is generated is about the same as the amount of crust that is recycled in the past 200, uh, 300 million years. So um, it seems that the volume of crust has been constant at least uh, in the past uh, uh, two or 300 million years. Now, uh, so this is what we know, or we think we know about modern continental crust. Um, we do not know a lot about uh, the history of um, continents and especially about uh, their composition through time. So this is a question that is still uh, very debated as illustrated by this very uh, contrasting result from uh, two uh, paper published in Science in uh, 2016 and 2017. Um, these two papers used uh, the sedimentary records to try to um, investigate the composition of the continents. And in the first one, uh, they use traced element ratio, and they conclude that the crust, the continents, was more mafic uh, in the Archean, so made of a higher proportion of basalts and comatites here. And then uh, this crust, or this continents, transition towards something more felsic that looked like modern continental crust. Um, at the beginning of the Proterozoic. Um, this study here, one year later, um, also based on sediments, but this time titanium isotopes, show that uh, there is almost no evolution or suggest that there is almost no evolution in uh, the silica content of the crust through time, and that it has always been felsic in the past 3.5 billion years. So you can see that there is still a lot to do uh, um, and we don't really know what was the composition of the continent through time. Another um, big question um, about uh, continents is the way uh, they have grown through time. So uh, the question on uh, the volume, how does the volume of continents evolve through time? Did we have small continents in the Archean or were they already pretty big? And also uh, the way uh, the, the continent has grown, um, is it a continuous growth or did it grow by pulses? So here is a very well-known figure uh, showing the different models that have been suggested for the, the evolution of the volume of continental crust through time. And you can see that there are a lot of models that have been proposed. Here I'm showing 19 models. 
Um, I'm not going to add a new model to this figure because I think it's, um, in fact, we do not have um, all the, in the information to constrain this volume. But uh, this is just to say that uh, this is something that is still um, not very well under understood. So most or a large part of these uh, studies on continental growth are uh, based on the zircon record. Um, you probably also know this figure that are showing here um, the distribution of uh, uranium late ages, so the distribution of zircon crystallization ages through uh, time with these uh, peaks and, uh, and throws. And here you have also uh, something that is a lot used, uh, the in situ hafnium isotopic composition of, uh, of zircons, uh, either uh, detrital or ignis. And you can see that uh, the database is uh, quite uh, large now, but we still do not agree on the interpretation of this, uh, of this data. Um, what I would like to, um, you to understand here is that uh, while we have a large number of uh, data points uh, here, for example, for hafnium neodymium, uh, hafnium isotopes in zircons, um, one data point in this database, um, in fact, represents um, only a piece of um, zircon grain because it's in situ measurements. And um, this is just one piece of zircon out of uh, sediments in one um, sample locality. So while we have a lot of data, there might uh, be some problem in terms of um, uh, representativity uh, because they are more subjected to preservation or sampling biases. The big difference between this uh, zircon record and um, the neodymium isotopic composition um, or database that I'm going to show you is the fact that in, in the neodymium database, we are using bulk uh, analysis. So one data point uh, represents about 100 milligram of uh, material, which is about 10 million times more material than what is analyzed for the zircons. And uh, we can do that because um, it is there is no uh, significant fractionation of neodymium isotopes. Um, with sedimentary processes. So basically the neodymium isotopic composition of sediments reflect that of uh, its sources. So with one data point, we already have um, the isotopic, the average isotopic composition of the large continental area. So it's much more powerful in terms of representativity compared to one data point in the, uh, in the in situ uh, hafnium or uranium led uh, databases of their accounts. So this is a, a powerful tool, and I'm not the first one, of course, to uh, have the idea to use neodymium isotopes uh, in sediments to uh, try to understand the composition and the growth of continental crust. This has been done a lot in the 80s with this um, famous paper from Frost or uh, Alec and Rousseau. And more recently, uh, Dewey Metal has also looked at this uh, database, but they were um, uh, based on a relatively small number of uh, data. So I decided to uh, revisit a bit this um, uh, relatively old studies with um, new, the new data that we have right now. And so I uh, did a new compilation of Sumerium neodymium isotopic uh, composition of sedimentary rocks through time. And I managed to gather about uh, 2,500, more than 2,500 uh, 2, data that are shown uh, here. The distribution is, is shown here. Uh, so I have uh, renormalized everything to the same ratio. I have uh, applied uh, an outlier rejection treatment um, so that we have a, a nice uh, database now. And uh, in the rest of the talk, I will mainly um, use um, a binning method. So several statistical tests um, shows that the most appropriate binning for this uh, distribution here is uh, 200 million years. So this is what I'm gonna be doing in the rest of the talk, um, mostly to simplify the calculations. So, um, the key question that are going to be addressed with this um, new compilation of uh, published um, Samarium neodymium isotopic data 
um, is basically the composition of the continents. So I'm going to try to show you that we can use the samarium neodymium ratio of the sediments to say something about the average silica content of the continent through time. And then uh, we're going to be using this time the neodymium isotopic composition of the sediments uh, through a new modeling approach to say something about the relative proportion of juvenile crust that was produced through time. Um, it is not possible to constrain the, the absolute volume. Um, and I'm going to try to show you why. So first of all, um, the composition of the continents. So it is not possible to uh, directly extract the silica content um, of the continents from that of the sediments, because uh, silica uh, is uh, fractionated through uh, mineral sorting. Uh, here I'm showing the example of a river. You can hear um, a section as a function of depth. And in fact, um, it is very clear now that um, the sediments that are transported in river, but it could be also by wind, um, are um, hydrodynamically sorted. So um, coarse grain sediment tend to be transported at bed load at the, bed, at the bottom of the, the river, while uh, finer sediments tend to be transported as suspended load. And this uh, variation in grain size here is associated to a chemical variation that you can see here, especially in terms of silica. So basically fine grain sediments uh, tend to have lower silica content compared to the average silica content of the catchment area, while um, coarser sediments at the bottom are more enriched in coarse. And so uh, they tend to have uh, silica content that is higher than the average catchment area. So we have to find another way to estimate silica contents of continents. And um, samarium uh, neodymium ratio uh, do a good job uh, because this, uh, these two elements are not fractionated during sediment transport. And they are uh, nicely correlated in igneous rocks with uh, silica content. So here is, I'm showing you um, the correlation between samarium neodymium ratio and silica content of uh, continental igneous rocks. So this is a compilation of uh, more than 2,000 data from the GeoRAC database. And you can see that uh, mafic rocks uh, tend to have uh, um, higher samarium neodymium ratio compared to felsic rocks. So we can um, determine the equation of this relationship and then use this relationship um, to calculate the silica content of, silica, of continent from the samarium neodymium uh, ratio of sediment um, that I have compiled. So here is the variation of samarium neodymium ratio uh, in sedimentary rocks. In pink, you have the bins average, and I'm showing behind in purple the moving average. So this is just to show you that uh, the binning has, has no impact on the variation of the data, and they pretty much show the same thing. Um, so I'm not uh, introducing a bias by binning the data every 200 uh, billion year, basically. So this variation is um, not very, the variations through time are not very large. And assuming that uh, this uh, reflects uh, the composition of continents, we can convert this with um, the relationship I showed you before, uh, this samarium neodymium into silica content. And we obtain this um, yellow uh, curve here with a 95% confidence interval. So the, the main information from that is that there is not a lot of changes through time. And um, within uncertainty, uh, the silica content of the continents is the same as uh, modern continental crust. There is no uh, significant transition from a mafic crust um, at the end of the Archean. And so um, the neodymium isotopic record of sediments uh, basically uh, tells us that uh, continent has been felsic in the past um, 3.7 billion years. So this is in, in good agreement with the results of uh, Greber et al. Uh, using titanium isotopes in shales, where there is uh, only a small variation in the silica content of the crust through time. And it is also in good agreement with uh, more recent uh, work that re-evaluates um, the trace element ratio as a proxy um, to determine the composition of the crust. And they show that basically 
um, there is not a lot of variation of in the silica content of the crust through time. Okay, now that uh, uh, we know uh, what the neodymium uh, in sediments tell us about the composition, we can see what isotopic composition are telling us about continental growth. So here is the compilation um, that, have, uh, that I have made. Uh, so a neodymium isotopic composition through time. Again, the bean average are in uh, pink and uh, the moving average are in purple behind. And uh, the good thing is that uh, the more recent beans um, match pretty well um, the isotopic composition of modern upper, upper continental crust that is about minus 10 and it's independently estimated from LUS. So this is a good news. And the way um, this um, composition evolves through time um, can be helpful to understand how the crust uh, was formed. So here I'm showing the evolution that the crust should have had if um, it was made of juvenile material only. So um, say if it was um, extracted from 100% extracted from the mantle at uh, each time T of, of Earth's history, uh, the trend should have been there. If uh, the crust was entirely made uh, from um, old crust from 3.8 billion years ago, um, the trend should have been this one. So clearly um, it is not this case uh, and not this one also. And um, the, the composition of the continent plots in the middle, meaning that it's always a mixture between reworked crust, old crust formed before, and then input of juvenile um, material uh, through time. Um, to quantify the amount of juvenile material, uh, the approach that I used is um, simply uh, considering that uh, at any time t, the composition, the neodymium isotopic composition of the crust could be expressed as a function of three contribution. So it depends on the neodymium isotopic composition of the existing crust, okay? Um, multiplied by its proportion. It also depends on uh, the isotopic composition of the juvenile crust, so the crust that is made during its bean time, and uh, minus the, con the contribution of the recycled crust that is lost uh, during the same bean time. So this is relatively simple. And if we make the assumption that uh, the isotopic composition of the recycled crust is similar to uh, the existing crust, basically you are recycling um, the same stuff as what is um, on continent. Uh, you can easily uh, extract the proportion of uh, juvenile crust for each bean uh, time. So if I show you that um, in this diagram, what I'm doing in fact is starting here at 3.7, where um, the isotopic composition of the continent match the composition of juvenile crust. So it means that by that time, all the continents were made of 100% uh, of juvenile crust. Okay, this is the proportion here. And then I'm reconstructed back the, the composition of free worked crust, the gray line here. And um, the, each time um, the continents have more radiogenic composition than this gray line here, it means that there is an input of juvenile crust. And the amplitude of this vertical deviation here between these two curves is basically the proportion of juvenile crust added um, at any time t of Earth's history. So from this uh, modeling approach, I'm able to um, extract about uh, six periods during which uh, the proportion of juvenile crust is relatively high, okay? And they are shown by the yellow bands here. So as I um, told you, we can only extract the proportion of juvenile crust. I'm not able to uh, determine what is the proportion of recycled or reworked crust. And because I'm, I do not have a, um, Basically, the model is under constraint to do that. Uh, I cannot constrain the absolute volume of crust through time. Um, we need to know the relationship between recycled crust and juvenile crust. This is this beta here I'm showing here um, to uh, get back to the absolute volume of crust through time. 
So I'm presenting here four possible scenarios, okay, given the model results. So if there was no recycling through Earth's history, um, here recycling is zero, then you have you you have this amount of juvenile crust at for each bin time, and the total amount of crust has increased to reach uh, its current value of one. If you assume that uh, recycling is uh, twice less than the production of uh, juvenile crust, then you also have a total amount of crust, uh, total volume of crust that increase, but less, uh, but less slowly. If you assume that uh, uh, the volume of juvenile crust is similar to uh, the volume of recycled crust, then the volume does not evolve through time. It's constant, and it's probably the situation for the past 200, uh, 300 million years. And finally, if you assume that you have more recycling than production of juvenile crust, then you have a decrease in the total volume. So we cannot constrain that, but the important uh, result from this uh, uh, model is that uh, whatever the beta value here, uh, you always have um, um, a spiky production of uh, juvenile crust. So you have these peaks in the production of juvenile crust, okay? And this is the important thing uh, coming out of this model. So, um, these peaks uh, here, in, this higher proportion of juvenile crust could reflect uh, an episodic continental grass, or in fact, pulses in the, in the production of juvenile crust, but uh, they can also be a, a bias in the record. So this could be a preservation bias or a sampling bias. And I will try to explore these uh, two possibility in the next uh, two slides, or maybe more, four slides. Um, to try to show you that it is indeed not possible. So um, the preservation bias. So um, the preferential bias has been introduced by uh, Oxworth et al. in 2010 to explain um, the peaks and, and throw in the, in the Zircon record. And it is basically um, the uh, uh, preferential preservation of continental crust during a collision period. So this is based on this uh, figure here that um, I have to say I do not understand very well. I think this is more like a conceptual idea than something that is really supported by the data. But anyway, the idea is that uh, you may have a, a sort of continuous production of, of continental crust during a, a normal plate tectonic regime. And uh, the fact that we observe these peaks here in the zircon record is only um, uh, is due to a, a bias in, in terms of preservation. So the initial record is that, and then uh, it is biased. And today we observe that, basically. Um, I don't think this type of bias is very relevant for um, neodymium isotopes uh, or uh, the, the result that I'm showing you here. Um, because um, the juvenile proportion that I am extracting from the, the, comp the isotopic composition of sediments is not based on data frequency. So um, it's not very clear how this bias could have an impact. And um, in addition, I uh, would expect that if we had this type of bias, then um, we should have a correlation between the distribution of uh, the data that I'm using uh, to constrain the model and the peaks here. And this is uh, clearly um, not what we have. There is no correlation between um, the input, so the distribution of the samarium neodymium data that I'm using in the model and um, the higher proportion of juvenile crust. So for me, this is not really an option uh, here. The second type of uh, bias we could have is um, what I call sample or erosion bias. And uh, it, is, uh, uh, it was introduced by Allegra and Rousseau in the 80s, and I think is used in almost all uh, crystal models um, of uh, Bruno Dream. Uh, and this bias is basically uh, based on um, the, the fact that um, the juvenile crust is preferentially eroded in um, high relief area. So in fact, the assumption being behind that is that juvenile crust is preferentially exposed in a high relief area. 
And because these high relief areas are um, the, the place on earth where sediments are um, produced, this is what is shown in this uh, map showing the sediment yields on continents. So the red areas correspond to the areas where you form um, the highest um, um, amount of sediments and it corresponds to uh, mountain bales basically and these Alps and the Himalayas. So if you have a lot of juvenile crust here, it means that juvenile crust may be overrepresented in the sediments compared to its true exposition on continents. So this uh, concept has been tested by uh, Bruno in a small river in uh, Australia, but has never been really uh, tested at the scale of the global sedimentary system. So what I wanted to do is uh, check whether um, this could be an option and if uh, juvenile crust was indeed overrepresented in modern sediments at the global scale. So I did a new compilation of uh, neodymium isotopic composition of river sediments that were discharged at the mouth of um, large rivers. And so I took a database of more than uh, 1,500 rivers and extract the river for which we had very high sediment uh, load. Okay, so um, it could be small drainage bas basin, but very high sediment load. And I also took the one that had the highest uh, drainage basin. Okay, so this um, led me with about 67 rivers. Um, so I think these are the major rivers in, in the world. And I was able to find the neodymium isotopic composition of the sediments discharged by uh, 49 out of the 67 rivers. So basically what I'm gonna show you is quite representative of, uh, of um, the sediments that are produced by river on our planet. So the 49 rivers are shown here. Um, this is their sediment load as a function of the maximum elevation in their catchment area. And um, the maximum elevation here is taken as a proxy for uh, topography. And you can see that there is a quite a decent correlation. This is not uh, my results. This is something that is known for uh, ages, I would say. Um, so if you have uh, high topography, such as here in the Himalayas, then you produce more sediments, okay? If we have a bias in the, in the neodymium isotopic record of sediments, we should see a correlation between um, a sediment load and um, their uh, neodymium isotopic composition. And we should see that um, rivers that are discharging a lot of sediments have more juvenile um, sediment composition than sediments that are um, discharging just a few sediments. And here is in fact what we have. So no correlation at all. And um, in fact, if you do uh, the simple average of all of these river, you end up having the same azotopic composition as the modern upper continental crust. So what it means is that there is no obvious sampling or um, erosion bias in the neodymium isotopic record. Um, and uh, basically it reflects pretty well the composition of uh, the continents. So to summarize a little bit, if uh, this is not a preservation issue or uh, a sampling bias, then it means that um, the peaks or the higher the high proportion that we see um, in juvenile crust for some period of times must reflect an episodic continental growth. Um, so in other words, this means that we have pulses in the production of uh, juvenile crust through time. So how can we explain um, these continental growth policies? Uh, several um, models have been proposed in the past. So the famous model of Tain and Hoffman in the 80s, uh, 90s, sorry, um, with this. Um, so here the explanation is that you have periods of time for which you, you have a normal uh, mode for plate tectonics. So this is the supercontinent cycles. And then at some period of time, you have the Momo episodes, which are uh, major overturns, major orogenies, where, where you have um, several large plume heads that uh, create oceanic plateaus uh, that are laterally created to form um, a lot of continental crust. So these are the continental growth periods. 
Another model that has been proposed more recently and, and that is also based on uh, plume or super plume activities is the model of uh, Arndt and Davai. And in this model, they suggest that super plume um, events that are here shown as domes uh, accelerate plate motions. Um, these uh, trigger rapid subductions, and if you have rapid subduction, you have um, um, an increased production of content across so the, the growth pulses. So I have tried to look whether we had some correlation between uh, this, um, the potential um, erosion products of superplumes, which uh, I think could be large igneous provinces, and the production of uh, juvenile crust. Um, so here I'm showing two histograms that are um, um, showing the number of uh, leaps events through time, okay, and this one is showing more the intensity, so this is in fact the reconstituted area of leap erosion products through time, so you have two big peaks here. And um, well, I have to say that uh, I don't think there, there are obvious correlation between these three uh, records. And maybe most importantly, uh, the periodicity of uh, LIPS event is relatively short compared to uh, what is observed here for uh, the production of Gemini crust. The periodicity is in the order of 50 million years. Here, the cyclicity is more like 500 million years, okay? And also the duration of the LIPS event is quite short. So, um, it seems to me that uh, it's difficult to find a relationship, at least with the data that we have right now, uh, between um, um, the production of juvenile crust and this uh, very big um, plume events, and uh, so the leaps events. So another um, possibility is that um, the juvenile crust production is related to supercontinent cycles. Um, here is an estimation of potential periods during which um, supercontinent um, has uh, assembled. So um, this is basically periods during which um, a large number of mountain building events has been counted. So the correlation is again not very uh, obvious. You may find a uh, yeah, correlation here, for example. So here is this big, this one, or this one. Um, here there is absolutely nothing at 0 0.7 at 0.7 uh, billion years, so it's not uh, that great. But at least uh, the periodicity and the duration of the supercontinent cycles are more in line with uh, uh, what I found here for continental growth. So they this uh, might be. Um, a more plausible explanation. And I wanted to show you the result of this uh, numerical simulation from uh, Coltis et al. So what they try to do here is just simulate normal plate tectonics. So they let the model run. And you can see that in fact, um, for some period of time, um, the plate velocities shown in by the red arrows here are um, just uh, slow. So you have uh, not a lot of subduction zones, okay? And because the driving force are changing uh, depending on uh, several factors, sometimes the plates are more rapid and you have uh, an acceleration of uh, uh, the tectonic plates. And so uh, this uh, leads to more subduction zone and so maybe uh, a variation in the production of uh, juvenile crust. So this is just to say that you do not maybe need a catastrophic event to create more uh, crust. Uh, this is just maybe the normal expression of uh, plate tectonics. Sometimes it's slow. Um, and so um, you have not a lot of crust produced and sometimes it's rapid because the drag forces are different and then you produce more crust. Okay, and I think I'm uh, done. So I wanted to uh, conclude on this and just remind you the, the main um, results or what the Simarium uh, Neodyma Mesotopic Record of Sedimentary Rocks is telling us. Uh, so first, um, we can see that uh, um, it seems that um, the, the crust has not changed in terms of silica uh, uh, contents through time. Um, we do not observe any significant variation in the Archean here, and it's very similar to, in fact, modern continents with an average composition that is above 68% in silica. 
And uh, it also uh, supports the idea that uh, the production of juvenile crust through time is episodic. Um, this cannot be, I think, a preservation or a sampling bias as uh, it could be the case for the zircon record. And um, I would like really to insist on this idea that this is just maybe the normal manifestation of plate tectonics and we don't need um, like super plume activities or even plume activities to explain this uh, growth peak through time. And I'm uh, finished and I'm happy to take your question now. Yes, great. Thank you very much. Um, we have a raised hand from Roberta Rudnick. Go right ahead. Hey, hi, Marianne. It's very nice to see you and thanks for a great talk. Hi, Roberta. Um, I have a question about how you inverted for silica content using the samarium neodymium ratios of the sediments. Mm -hmm. And in particular, did you account for the fact that, you know, felsic igneous rocks are going to have probably an order of magnitude more light rare earth elements than mafic or ultra mafic rocks? Yes. Um, yes. So, in fact, this is. Um, in, in the model, this is taken into account. Um, and if you do a more uh, normal uh, mixing, I would say between uh, mafic, uh, I don't have the figure here, too bad, uh, but I could show you that. Um, if you do a more normal mixing, taking into account uh, neodymium concentration um, in the samarium, um, so if I go back to this figure, let me... Uh, this one, right? This one. Um, if you do a normal, a more uh, normal mixture, uh, sorry, uh, between uh, mafic and uh, felsic rock, so you do a, a felsic end member and a mafic end member, then um, the curve, the curvature of uh, the mixing trend is exactly the same as this one. So. Um, by doing that, uh, I'm in fact taking into account the neodymium concentration and the difference uh, between the uh, neodymium concentration of uh, mafic and felsic rocks. Does that answer yeah, to the question? Huh. Uh, well, I'm not sure I understood it, but but I'll read it and try to <laughs> see how <laughs> see how you took into consideration the concentrations because I think there's some pretty good data, as you know, uh, from from the trace elements in old sedimentary rocks that there are certainly more mafic and ultra mafic materials around. And in particular, if you look at copper concentrations, which are dominated, which are really sensitive to how much basalt is present. And this is what Kong Chen did in his 2020 GCA paper. Um, it's pretty inescapable, I think, from those data that, that there had to be a lot more mafic rocks present. And even if you look at your samarium neodymium ratio data and the inferences from that, you see that the only time it dips down to more mafic composition is actually around 3 billion years ago. So uh, the other interesting thing to look at would be to see you know, how, many, how many data are represented you know, in those when you get to the older data, you get you fall off, right? You get a lot a lot fewer sediments, um, so you have to worry about representation and whatnot. Anyway, uh, but but I it's it's good food for thought and discussion. Yeah, I think uh, I agree partly with what you say. Um, I think most of the variation that we see in trace element ratios or trace element concentration in uh, archaean sedimentary rocks could be accounted for the presence of comatites only. It does not necessarily require the presence of basalt. So there is comatites disappear. That's too not true when you. That's not true when you look at copper. Commodities don't care about copper. They're very low copper concentrations, just like the salts. And that's why Kong Chen used copper concentrations to try to figure out how much basalt is present. So yes, there was more commodity in the Archean. It's still, mm -hmm. there, but um, basalt had to be higher uh, if you look at things like copper. Okay, well, maybe we can, uh, there's some uh, disagreement on the, the trace element record of sedimentary rocks, right? <laughs> Thank you, Roberta. All right. 
The next question is from Christopher Spencer. It says, hi, Marion, great talk. It looked like the periods of high percent juvenile crust aligned with periods of low data frequency. Is that correct? Also, how do your results change if you decrease the bin width? Okay, so uh, this is not correct. So I checked that there is no obvious correlation between the distribution of the data and uh, the model results. So this is the first point. And the second point is uh, about the binning. Um, I can do the exact same treatment with moving average or uh, with a lower binning, say 100 million years. And this does not change the, the, the the pattern. So the peaks are uh, mostly at the same places, uh, but I think more, more importantly, there are still some peaks. And if I use a binning of 100 million years, then uh, statistically it's not um, correct because I end up with beans that, that have not enough data to be well constrained. So um, I've tried to check whether the binning has an impact and I don't think it has a lot of impact. Any impact. Okay, thanks for that. Our next one is from uh, Jean Bedard. He says, are the neodymium isotopes done only on zircon separates? That means there will, uh, there will not be samples of basalt which, would, which don't have much zircon. No, not at all. They're, they're done on uh, bulk uh, sedimentary rocks. So this could be, um, I have a figure somewhere. Okay, uh, this could be uh, shale, siltstone, sandstones, but it's uh, not at all zircon separate. So it is um, supposed to sample uh, mafic crust and also felsic crust. So Jean I got in, Alex. Oh yeah, you can go ahead, take, take it away. Oh, merci, Marie. Uh, the, that's exactly what I wanted to know. You know, I was just worried okay. of, you know, if you're analyzing zircon, well, uh, no, but no, no. with respect to your uh, your point about uh, uh, the longevity and the size of Archean lips, I, I don't think we can estimate that quantitatively. I, I, that's impossible. These yes, are I agree. Threads, right? mm, this is a uh, this is very difficult to estimate, and I'm not sure these uh, records are very reliable. But um, I was just saying that given the data that we have right now, I don't see the obvious correlation, but it might be related. I don't think we can we can have a firm conclusion on that. Okay, well, thank you. That was a great talk. Thank you. And next, uh, Walty had a question. Uh, hi, Marianne, very interesting and well presented. What about the negative and positive peaks between 3.2 and 3.7 billion? Is this the bias of Chertz and can Chertz give us any information at all? So are we talking about uh, the silica content of the crust here? We're talking about sedimentary charts. Uh, what do you mean uh, here? Yeah, yeah, well, there no, is a lot, of, a lot of chart sediments at this time. Yes, OK. But um, if this was the case, you need to have the chart on the continents uh, to, to um, have a positive contribution in the silica content. We had a lot of chert, but I don't think they were on continents and eroded by that time. They were below seawater. So we're not supposed to be sensitive to the presence of chert while looking at uh, uh, detrital sedimentary rocks here. So you've only looked at detrital yeah, yeah, yeah. It's only terrigenous. Yeah, it's, it's uh, shale, siltstone, sandstones. There is no um, chemical or sediments here in the database. Why? Um, why? It's because when you look at the neodymium isotopic composition of uh, chert, for example, you do not know whether this is uh, tracing or coming from the continents or um, it could be also hydrothermal, for example. So um, to not be biased by potential input from um, hydrothermal uh, uh, sources, I decided just to look at the detrital record, I would say heterogeneous record, something that comes from the continents because this is what we want to probe here. 
if you if you have the charts on the continental crust mm -hmm. wouldn't that change the yes um, yes this uh, would probably contribute to higher silica content i agree but is it something that we expect uh, in the archean having a lot of chert uh, sitting on the continent um, could be possible well why not um, well we do from the archean no? plenty of chert sitting on the continental crust Yes, why not? But uh, you would need a lot of them to uh, to get to these uh, very high values here. Yes. But also, I presume uh, uh, for chords, uh, samarium neodymium would not behave the same way as for upper continental crust. So if you recycle chord, it would be uh, recycling a signal coming from from the continent plus hydrothermal flux rather than, um, so it should not affect um, your estimate of. Uh, yeah, and also there is not a lot of uh, neodymium in uh, in charts in general, so it should not affect the the comp the the isotopic composition or the concentration of the, the digital sediments if they are eroded on continents. Mm, you're right. Thank you. All right, our, our next one in the chat was Bodo Weber. Great talk. Good to see people still looking at Samarium neodymium isotopes. Are the juvenile crust ages, Samarium neodymium depleted mantle model ages? Uh, I ask because the deviate uh, typically, they deviate typically by one to 200 million years from crustal growth ages. Uh, you mean, um, yes, yeah, so I'm using um, neodymium isotopic composition or neodymium model ages. It's quite similar. And of course, it depends on uh, how the composition of the depleted mantle is calculated. But um, I did several sensitivity tests for that. And uh, where is that one? Do I have it somewhere? No, I don't have it. Okay, but basically, um, if you assume, um, so in, in the model, the, the depleted mantle is supposed to be produced at uh, 4.5 billion years, okay, uh, with a large depletion event. But if you assume uh, that it's produced at 3.8, or if you even calculate the model ages from a primitive mantle composition, you get uh, the same peak pattern at the same location, it's just uh, the amplitude of the peaks that are different. So um, in fact, the model result would be the same and it means that uh, it does not depend on the way um, the neodymium isotopic composition of uh, the depleted mantle is calculated. Okay, you would have a small variation in the amplitude, um, but I don't think in, in any case, the amplitude is very reliable. What is interesting here is, re is really the peak pattern. Um, that produce um, crystal growth uh, pulses through time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'm I'm here. Thank you for for that answer. Uh, uh, just uh, one one point here. The issue is that most of the continental crust uh, grows from subduction zones and in active continental margins. And if you look at the ages of these rocks, they are typically uh, uh, younger than the, if you calculate the model ages. And even uh, uh, if you look, uh, if you have a group of rocks, and sometimes you can calculate some aramnodymium uh, isochrones, and the isochrones also are usually about 100, 150 million years younger than the depleted mantle model ages. That's because you don't ha have only depleted mantle in these rocks. It's always a mixture of a little bit of older continental crust. So it, it deviates and it not checks with uh, with the peaks that you can find on on zircon ages, so it has not uh, directly comparable comparability with the zircon ages on on these peaks. But I agree that you see it's pretty nice that you see that you have always uh, after every five hundred million years or so you have another peak, and that goes very well with the supercontinent theory. Very nice talk. Thanks again. Thank you. Well, yes, it's true that I didn't really talk about uh, the potential correlation between uh, the peaks that I'm showing here and the zircon peaks. And uh, I'm not doing that because um, 
I don't think um, it would be uh, very nice to do the correlation, especially because the binning that I'm using is quite wide. And so the correlation is not very meaningful. It's globally the same um, in the same area. So we have a peak at 1.7, at 2.7 billion years. But um, in details, it's very difficult to correlate the two records because mainly because of the binning I'm using in, uh, to do the calculations. Thanks. Great, so next, uh, Kent Condi raised his hand. You can go ahead and unmute yourself. Uh, great talk, Marion. Um, I noticed you didn't uh, quote uh, any of the data from Steve Pitts and myself. We published several papers on the uh, periodicity of uh, large igneous provinces and detrital and igneous zircons. Perhaps you're not aware of those. I'll, I'll send you uh, some PDFs of them, but uh, we definitely see a strong peak at about 1.9 in the lips, and you have a strong peak at about 2. Um, and it may be due to the binning that those two don't agree, but they, they're very close together. We also have a strong peak at about 1, and you also have a peak at around 1. Um, it might be a good idea to take a look at our latest papers on this and see how they correlate with your your data. Yeah, yeah, I'm uh, aware of your paper, of course, and I know you you are uh, you are defending this uh, uh, gross pulses. But uh, so I think this is what you are uh, seeing with the zircon record. The, the only problem is that uh, the binning here that is used is just a bit annoying to, to do a direct comparison. But I agree that uh, at the first order, it fits pretty well with some of the peaks that are seen uh, um, yeah, uh, at one, for example, also there is one at 2.7, 2.5. So it's, um, yeah, it could be very similar. I agree. Thank you. It's the next qu question is from Nick Roberts. Is age on the x-axis of the, dep is it the depositional age? If so, did you only take data with robust estimates of deposition age? Yes, this is the deposition age, and this is a big problem when you do a compilation because you do not have, uh, there are a lot of data, Sumerium neodymium data, for which you don't have the exact age of the sediments. So I tried to not uh, take these ones. Um, of course, uh, there might um, also be an uncertainty related to this deposition age. And this is in fact taken into account while um, trying to estimate the most appropriate binning. So by taking a binning of 200 million years, I'm sort of uh, taking into account the potential uncertainty on the deposition age. Uh, next question. Sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Olivier Vander Olivier Vanderhig asks, uh, "How does the deposition age of a sediment link with the age of the material, uh, with the material that has been eroded?" Uh, well, so this is in fact um, I don't have the model ages. So. Um, Today, um, the average age of the continental crust is about 1.5 or 1.8 billion years. And we always have, um, um, say, a difference between the deposition age and the age and the model age of the crust, in fact. But of course, with time, it, um, it decreases. But um, interestingly, I have noticed that several times, that um, it's always about one third of uh, the age of the sediment. So I don't know why exactly, but uh, for example, yes, you will have uh, um, a crust that is eroded that has an average age of about 300 million years. Okay, so it's, uh, there is always a difference and it's normal because uh, the crust is a mixture between um, old re-rock material and something that is juvenile. So by definition, an age of zero. So it's always uh, older. The model age is always older than, uh, than, the de than the deposition age. All right. Um, Kent, I don't know if you put your hand up again or I just didn't click to lower your hand. I'm not sure. 
No, I didn't put it up again. I, I should have okay. removed it. No, that's okay. I think that was my fault. Um, okay. We, it doesn't look like we have any more questions um, coming in. So uh, thank you very much for this, Marianne Carson. This is a great data set and it uh, developed a lot of good um, discussion. That's what we like to see. Um, so with that, thank you everybody for showing up and um, uh, we are looking forward to seeing you all next week. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming and thank you for the organization, Alex. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thanks, Marianne.